Sure. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, just wanted to say uh, we're, we're excited to run our workshop today. Um, so today's lunchtime workshop has a focus on tackling practical problems which are relevant for research, healthcare delivery, and population health. Um, this this um, this event is also endorsed for one TRCPD point. So if um, you have an event bright registration ticket, please retain it for proof of attendance. It's also my privilege now to introduce um, our Centre Director, Professor Wendy Chapman. Um, Wendy leads the Centre for Digital Transformational Health. Her research focuses on language in clinical notes, and she has developed and evaluated natural language processing applications for clinical notes and knowledge representation of the information described in the notes. Um, Wendy has um, she fell in love with language as she learned Cantonese in Hong Kong and came to the world of healthcare for the opportunity to apply her linguistic interests to practical and socially useful problems. So um, I'd like, now I'd like to hand the, the time over to Wendy who will be leading us through the workshop on developing a clinical natural language processing system. All right, thank you, Don. This is the first in our new series of uh, more, more hands-on uh, practical talks that aren't focused on research, but more on how to do things. Um, you know, it's difficult with Zoom rather than being in person. And so I've adapted some things that I've done in the past and we'll just see how it goes. Uh, I moved to Melbourne in September and I'm really happy to see, I see a lot of names and faces on, on the uh, Zoom call today that I recognize. And so starting to um, get a professional network and friends and looking forward to talking to you. All right, so let's see, how do I go down? Uh, did I have to hit that? Okay, I wanna start uh, by introducing you to Sasha Dublin. She is a health services researcher in Seattle, Washington. And a few years back, she wanted to do a study about um, are patients who are treated with opioids more likely to get pneumonia? Uh, so she needed to get a cohort of patients, you know, those who, who were, all of them were treated with opioids, but those that got pneumonia and those that didn't to do her research. So what she did is she hired two people for two years full time to read the chest x-ray reports of all of these patients and put them into two bins, either pneumonia or no pneumonia. And that, you know, first of all, postponed her study a long time. It made it much more expensive. And so she wondered, you know, could we have used artificial intelligence to do that? Well, everyone uh, talks about artificial intelligence even at the dinner table nowadays. And we know that AI has the potential to Ooh, make sure everyone's muted, <laughs> has the potential to transform everything that doctors do. Um, in theory, this is a book by Eric Topol about deep medicine. And uh, his claim is that if we can free physicians from the tasks that interfere with human connection, then AI can create space for, you know, for the, the, the humans to really work together in this partnership of health. And so uh, there's a lot of research and work in developing AI algorithms. Now there's some fear too uh, about, you know, is artificial intelligence going to end mankind? Is it going to take over the world? Um, you know, there's been lots of movies about this. In reality, if you look though about what artificial intelligence can do, uh, it, it, it can do a lot of amazing things, but it, it hits a barrier. And let me just describe one uh, instance of how AI can really get screwed up. So this is a, a, a vision algorithm and it can identify, you know, there's a book, this is a person and I'm 99% sure, this is a laptop, this is a cup. Um, but on the right side, if you insert an elephant into the image, all of a sudden it can't recognize the cup anymore. And you know, that's hard to explain. Why did that happen? And so there are a lot of things about artificial intelligence that when you really get down to it are confusing and, and, um, and not robust. So she, uh, Pe Pedro Domingos concludes that people worry that computers will get too smart and take over the world. But the real problem is that they're too stupid and they've already taken over the world. And I, I think that seems like a true statement. So you're gonna learn how um, stupid NLP is today. <laughs> now, what, how does natural language processing fit into AI? I liked this diagram that I found where um, natural language processing is one of the activities that happens in artificial intelligence. Um, machine learning and deep learning are terms that you probably hear a lot of too. And natural language processing can use machine learning or deep learning algorithms to do its work, but it doesn't have to. 
And so that this is a, a nice demonstration of where we're at. And we're going to be talking about the rule-based side of natural language processing today, but that doesn't intersect with machine learning and deep learning. And that's largely because I want you, I want to talk about you know, how, how it works inside that black box. So the basic idea of natural language processing is you take a, a text document, you plug it into the system, and it outputs some kind of information that's, that's structured or coded. It might be a classification, like this is pneumonia. This report you know, represents pneumonia or it doesn't represent pneumonia. It might be information extracted from the report, or it might be a summary of what was in the report. And so natural language processing and AI are very sexy, like my favorite car. Um, this is a, a 458 Italia Ferrari, beautiful, amazing. But what we're going to do is we're going to look under the hood and see uh, what's, what's happening and what makes it work. So the first activity is I want you to be an NLP system. And um, the, the case that we're going to work on right now is from biosurveillance. And so we're going back in time from year 2000 to about 2008. I worked in disease surveillance, and we used natural language processing to uh, look at early warning systems of outbreaks. This is the RODS lab that I um, was affiliated with at the University of Pittsburgh. And so in this graph, you can see um, respiratory, you know, patients coming to hospitals in this county with respiratory problems, and then there was a big peak. And, and it's multiple hospitals, so you might not realize that with one hospital that there's something going on in the community you didn't know about. But if you can aggregate multiple hospitals, then you can say, you know, what, what happened there? Is, there? is there an outbreak happening? Is there a bioterrorism event? This one was, in fact, uh, one emergency department had a bunch of people come in with carbon monoxide exposure. But uh, my first grant was to build a respiratory kind of NLP system for biosurveillance. And so we were looking at the emergency department and the chief complaints and the reports that are, that are typed or dictated after a patient leaves the emergency room. And we wanted to find a, a, a lot of different findings that would indicate that someone had a respiratory problem. And so these are the five, five of the findings or symptoms that we are right now going to try to um, identify from text. All right, so I need you all here to, to think of how, how, to, uh, how to be an NLP system. And we just popped up a poll. So just scoot that poll over so you can see the report. This is a real patient report. And uh, there are two mentions of dyspnea in here. I want you to read those um, sentences and answer the question, do you think that this, this is an acute case of dyspnea, meaning that it's, it's recent and you know, just come on recently? Is it chronic? That they've had it for a long time, so maybe it's not an indication of an outbreak, or do they not have dyspnea? So click your answer. I'll give you maybe 15 more seconds. Okay, I got three more seconds and I'm gonna hit end poll. Oh, I, I'm gonna let Don hit it though. <laughs> All right, so let's, uh, we can, let's look at the results of this poll and see what people thought. So 76% said that that's acute, it's something new, um, but you can see it's not unanimous uh, about what's going on. So I would like to invite Graham Hart, who's on the call. Uh, Graham is a, is a critical care physician and I'm going to have, we're, we're going to talk about, um, about this. So I would say, and we would say for our project that this was acute. And so let's, so Graham, are you on? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So Graham, what did you say though? Did you agree with me that this was acute? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, but largely that's in the absence of, uh, information to the contrary rather than a confirmatory information to the positive. So in the sense that um, the person has complained of it, uh, it may be at on, on exertion, that's not clear, uh, because the patient doesn't appear to have uh, symptoms, objective signs in the physical exam 
supporting the diagnosis at the moment. They're not, uh, they've got a normal respiratory rate and they're not hypoxemic and so forth. So, and, and there's no past history here to say whether the patient has any chronic respiratory disease suggesting it is chronic. So in the absence of information around chronicity, I've assumed acute uh, and I've assumed it's possibly on exertion or effort because there's no signs of it right now, even though there's a temperature which would often make people breathe a bit harder. Uh, and um, I see you've highlighted the ED course, patient should return for increased shortness of breath, suggesting that that's kind of uh, a new thing, but it's not severe enough yet to make uh, the clinician worried about it as a uh, cause of admission to hospital yet. All right, thank you for that reasoning. Um, help me out here because a lot of people on the call probably didn't know what dyspnea was. And um, it says dyspnea at the top, but then it says shortness of breath at the bottom. If you're going to build an NLP system to identify the dyspnea in this report, what do we need? Uh, well, they're, they're synonyms for each other. Uh, one of them may well have more of a subjective and the other are more of slightly more objective, but they're used interchangeably. Uh, often there will be a diphthong in there in the, in the non-American world. There would be an O before, between the N and the E, uh, which would make it even a bit more complicated. But um, uh, yeah, so most times they'd be used uh, as synonyms within the clinical space. And then you also have potential for abbreviations such as SOB or uh, SOBOE on exertion. So um, uh, in the heart failure scene, you'd have shortness of breath related to position, which would be orthopnea. So there's a whole range of varieties of a theme. Okay, all right. So, so my NLP system has, a has to have a dictionary and it has to have a bunch of different variations. Um, yeah, okay, let's go on to the next one. The next one's tachypnea. So let's launch the poll for, for tachypnea and read this and tell me what you think. Okay, I'll give you about 10 more seconds. <laughs> All right, let's look what people thought. Okay, so most people said it's absent. Again, a little bit of disagreement. It could have been um, mistakes or, or, or not. Uh, so, so we would say this is absent. So Graham, you're building an NLP system for this. What, how do I, how do we know this is absent? How do, how do all these people on the line know when we're not all, we're not all medical experts or clinicians? Uh, yeah, right. So although the patient has complained of some, uh, some short or dyspnea in the past, uh, one of the objective features of, of um, shortness of breath is an increase in breathing rate. So tachypnea is the term that would be used in uh, clinical parlance for uh, rapid breathing. Uh, rapid breathing uh, is probably age dependent. So children tend to breathe faster than adults. Uh, as, as would be the case with their heart, resting heart rate. Uh, and uh, obviously it is uh, context sensitive as well. So if we all walk, walk or run upstairs or run 100 meters or go on a marathon, we will get to, to Kipnik as a physiological um, uh, sequelae of that in order to cope with the extra energy production, CO2 production and acid that we create from that exercise. But in the, this context of um, potential, a patient who's potentially unwell with a respiratory infection, tachypnea would be taken as a sign of either fever, um, a complication such as diabetes, acidosis, or a relating to pneumonia or pulmonary infiltrate that might reduce the efficiency of the breathing, so you have to breathe faster. Normally, okay, so, it would so be nice to see a respiratory rate documented. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, doesn't say the actual rate, but how would how, how 
how would a, a lot of people, even if without medical knowledge, how do people know that the answer for this is absent? Because it says that there's a negation word there, neither. Yeah. Okay, so if we're going to build an NLP system, we need to consider negation. And in this case, the negation word is neither. That's a strange word to think if you were going to create a list of negations that, that you need to have that one in there. Okay, excellent. But the other, the, uh, the or, um, if we're grammatically correct, should have an N in front of it as well, shouldn't it? Right, it says neither or. So yeah. your system better be robust to bad grammar if it's going to be looking at medical notes, clinical notes. Okay, let's move on to fever. Uh, so, so look at this and tell me what you think about whether or not the patient has a fever. So we'll take about 20 seconds. Okay, five more seconds. All right, let's close the poll and talk about fever. Um, so I would say the patient has an acute fever. And so we, we talked about synonyms. It says he's modestly febrile. So we need a synonym for fever, which is febrile. Um, do you see any contradictions in this? report, Graham. It says modestly febrile, and then it, and then it actually has the temperature that was measured by the clinician, and it's 39. Yes, I, I, would, I, would not, um, I would not describe the 39.5 temperature as being modest. Okay. How would you define fever on, on that numeric scale? Uh, generally speaking, up to about 37.5 is regarded as probably within normal limits. Um, there are sort of some hormonal cycles uh, in women that would uh, potentially put the temperature up uh, uh, a little bit like 37.5. Uh, and um, if you've just rushed up the stairs, you might have a mild, fever, a mild temperature like that. Anything much more than 38, and certainly up to 39.5 or 40 is considered a significant temperature. Okay, so if you're building an NLP system, um, in addition to <clears> the synonyms, <throat> you need a way to look for uh, findings like this where there's a measurement. So they might say febrile or has a fever, or they might say temperature or temp, and then give an, a number. And then you have to be able to set, you know, if it's above this threshold, I call it fever. If it's below the threshold, I don't. And there might be some disagreement with clinicians about where that threshold is. Um, if we look at the bottom sentence, this is the same sentence where it talked about shortness of breath, but it's not talking about the patient having a fever. So if you're just looking for the word fever, and you, you, you um, might mark that as an indication of fever. But tell me, tell me about the, um, you know, the, the, the linguistic characteristics of this sentence, Graham. You're, you're not a linguist, but you're an English speaker. <laughs> what, what does this sentence mean? Okay, so I guess the, the clinician is trying to establish some sort of escalation criterion. So. If my treatment is not work, I've started some antibiotics, I would expect that within 24, 36 hours, the temperature should start to resolve, the patient should start to feel better. So therefore, if the patient's symptoms are getting worse so that they are feeling subjectively more short of breath, or if their fever is not resettling, then they're probably not responding to my treatment. And I need to know about that and they need to come back and see me. Okay, so you told me the, the medical part, so let me talk about the linguistic part of building an algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> so it says, you know, looking for the word fever, there's no, there's not a negation here. So it's not that it's, they don't have a fever necessarily, but it says the patient should return for fever. And so it's talking about something in the future. And I need to be able to identify that and not call this fever when it's not saying the patient has a fever. At the same time, it says should return for a recurring fever. Well, that implies that the patient has had a fever. So it can be very complex to that we as English speakers know a lot. From, from looking at just the words in the sentence without any clinical knowledge and trying to get your NLP system to replicate that can be much more complex than we expect. Okay, let's look at cervical adenopathy, cervical lymphadenopathy. And this one's short. Take, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds on this one. I figure you should be getting quicker at it.
Okay. Okay, so we would say this is absent and everyone agreed that this one's absent. So let's talk about that. I'm looking for cervical lymphadenopathy. Um, and I see, first of all, I see the word without. Wendy, my poll just closed before I had a chance to click it. Okay. What were you going to click? <laughs> were you going to click absent or something different? You don't need to, to click on the poll. We can look at what everybody else had there. Um, but so here's a new word for my negation. I need to have the word without so that I know it's negated. But, you know, it, it, there, there's lots of different types of adenopathy and lymphadenopathy. And I'm looking for cervical. And it doesn't have the word cervical here. So, Graham, how did, how did I know that this is cervical lymphadenopathy when it doesn't say cervical? I wonder if Graham, did you get muted, Graham, or if something went wrong? I think Graham's up here. Yeah. Oh, okay, he got disconnected. Okay. Yeah. Can we chip in? Um, uh, yes, chip in. Yeah, sure. It's, um, it's in the context of a neck examination, which is the uh, cervical region. Okay. So my NLP algorithm then has to identify sections, and it has to know that the next section um, is you know, everything in that section is talking about the neck and has the anatomic location of the neck. And therefore, if cervical adenopathy, lymphadenopathy is lymphadenopathy of the neck, then I would say that this is a positive case of it. And then I look for the negation and say it's negated. All right, last one is pneumonia. So read over these sentences and let me know what you think about pneumonia. Okay, five more seconds. Okay. Okay, now this one, there's a lot of disagreement on this one. <clears throat> so if we look at the first mention, it, it, it says the patient has a past history of pneumonia two months ago. So that's a, a previous Pneumonia, it might not be previous, it might be the same pneumonia that's continued and not been solved. We don't really know. But it is this mention of pneumonia really is talking about something in the past. So this is where, um, you know, I, I had an infectious disease physician working with me on this project. And we read the literature and he has his domain knowledge and we laid out, you know, here are the 35 respiratory things that we think are important to look for. But, but until you actually get into the data, you, um, you can't be sure about your case definition that you're setting. And so when you start looking at the reports and the way that it's talked about, then you, you, you have to be able to make changes. So part of building an NLP algorithm is really getting into the data. And so in this case, we'd say, you know, they mention a past history of pneumonia and they mention that the chest X-ray indicates pneumonia. So I think we should actually have both. We should have a variable for past history of pneumonia because that might be influential in whether this is a new outbreak. Or, and, and one for acute pneumonia. So we would change our model based on the results of this. And so I put acute and, and chronic because we ended up adding a variable for each. Now, if you look down in the ED course, it talks about the chest X-ray finding and it says it reveals bilateral interstitial pulmonary infiltrates. So would somebody tell me that does not say the word pneumonia? Um, infiltrate is not a synonym for pneumonia necessarily. So tell me why I marked that as evidence of pneumonia. Um, when you, am I back online now? Oh, you're back, Graham. Yes. Yeah, sorry, my, my audio just dropped out for some bizarre reason. <clears throat> okay. um, so we're looking at the x-ray finding, and, and I want you to tell me why I marked that as evidence of, of pneumonia when it doesn't say the word pneumonia. Sure. Well, I guess it's, uh, this is a very um, controversial clinical point in the sense that uh, pneumonia is a constellation of inflammation within the lung or the bronchial system for bronchopneumonia. And, in, and involving all of the actual uh, gas exchange units or alveoli. Those, when they get fluid and inflammation in them, become more radio-opaque to X-ray, 
and so they appear as a shadow or an infiltrate. The infiltrates can occur with heart failure, with other uh, conditions as well. And so an infiltrate in its own right is not necessarily a diagnostic um, a mandatory feature. Sorry, infiltrate does not necessarily automatically imply pneumonia, but if there's a fever, an elevated white count, and infectious parameters such as increased levels of sputum, then you, that constellation would be taken as evidence of pneumonia. But it's hard to have pneumonia without an infiltrate. Okay. All right. So here, the the this type of infiltrate would be um, a, a radiological finding of pneumonia. And so I have to decide on for my NLP algorithm, am I just looking for explicit mentions or am I looking for symptoms or findings that that are indicative of that? And when it, when when radio when a radiological diagnosis is one of the important most important elements of the diagnosis, then you have to be able to model that too. Yes, the, the constellation of um, dyspnea, temperature of 39.5, and a pulmonary infiltrate would be highly suggestive. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So we, okay, so I, I hope that you learned that, first of all, <clears throat> you know a lot um, as even if you're a clinician, you know a lot about the clinical manifestations. If you are a language speaker, which everyone is, then you know a lot about this, even if you don't understand the medicine behind it. And we all know a lot more than, than the machine knows. And the goal of natural language processing development is to build a machine that replicates that human knowledge. And that's a much harder task than we normally realize. So, why is it so complex? And the first, one of the first things you do in natural language processing is you identify the named entities, the things that you want to find. So we were identifying mentions of dyspnea, and I highlighted those in blue. Next, you have to look at the context and say, is it, is it being negated or et cetera? And then, and then you have to really look at the whole report because there are multiple mentions of things in the report, and you have to synthesize that together. And that would be... A, um, um, an example of discourse processing. So let's just step through these things and, and see what's going on. First of all, we saw that there's a lot of variation in the way you can describe the same thing. And some of that is due to just language in general, that, that um, derivation and inflection. And English is much simpler than other languages, but still you, you have the adjectival form and the noun form. Uh, with inflection, you have you know, plural versus singular, and you have the tense, past, present or future and, and other variations. And so your NLP system has to be able to address that. You wouldn't want to, to um, if it says opacities and you're looking for an opacity that you don't capture it. But the biggest source of stress for an NLP developer is the, the synonymy. There's so many ways to say the same thing and you'll never have a dictionary that covers all of them. The other side of the coin is polysemy. And that's where you have one word, but that one word has multiple meanings or multiple word senses. And so sometimes it's, you know, differentiating, you see the word discharge. Are they talking about discharge from the hospital or are they talking about something gross coming out of the body? Um, but then again, the, a, a really vexing characteristic of language is our use of acronyms and abbreviations. And so if you see something like APC, it could mean so many different things. And what it means is very context dependent. So being able to identify those acronyms and abbreviations. And my work in um, emergency departments, chief complaints, the, you know, there are, there are hundreds of ways to say diarrhea, <laughs> to misspell it, have an abbreviation. Uh, it's just, it's, it, it's incredible. Okay, so those are things you have to think about when you're designing your named entity recognizer. The next part is, okay, I've identified my mentions of, of fever, for example, and now I need to know uh, look at the context. So negation is is extremely important. Um, a very early study when I was a postdoc, we showed that about half of all the clinical concepts in the reports are negated. And in radiology, it's more than it's closer to two thirds. So you have to be able to differentiate those that are negated from those that are affirmed. And there's explicit negation where it has a word like no or not. And then there's just some, some things that you need clinical knowledge for where, where it's implied that it's absent. When it says lungs are clear upon auscultation, then you know that these three things are absent, even though it doesn't mention them explicitly. And negation, it's really, it's really a continuum from they definitely don't have something to they definitely do have something. And there's a lot of uncertainty in between. And that uncertainty might be because they're just not sure. Like in our example, it said they treated the patient for presumptive sinusitis, 
you know, they presumed he had sinusitis, but they don't know for a fact. Um, but it, it also the reports are used for clinical reasoning. And so the clinician will use the report to document, you know, um, results of, and of physical exams and other, you know, lab tests, and then new information comes in and they're reasoning about what's going on. And that reasoning is going to uh, display the uncertainty um, of the clinician. Also, sometimes an exam is ordered um, to rule something out. And so when you see rule out pneumonia, it's they either they either they think they might have pneumonia and they want to um, check it, but it's more likely they, they think they probably don't have pneumonia, but they just want to be sure. And so they're doing this to rule it out. And so you have to be able to really identify that reason for exam. And that indicates that there's some uncertainty. Temporality, you know, clinical reports tell a story and that story happens over time. They talk about things that happened in the past. They talk about things that are hypothetical or not specific. Um, and there's the temporal course of the disease where they, you know, they have some kind of finding, they take some kind of treatment and, and then the finding resolves or decreases. And that can really confuse your NLP system if you are not taking into account this um, story unfolding. The discourse processing, we saw that the report structure matters. You know, the anatomic location is sometimes in the section header. In some reports, certain sections carry more weight. In radiology reports, the impression section is more important. And so you might have your NLP system only look at the impression section, assuming that, that, that they really do uh, mark it as a section and that you can identify it. And then this is a particularly frustrating problem that's arisen as, as EMRs have come into their own and um, clinicians move from dictating to typing. And so now they create all kinds of shortcuts and templates that they copy and paste and your NLP system um, is supposed to be able to recognize not only sentences and lists, and but also all kinds of uh, variations on templates. The last thing on discourse processing is, is co-reference. So look, look at this short paragraph. And I didn't do a quiz for this, but I go, feel free to pipe up. You know, how big is, is the nodule described in this paragraph? You, you can answer, Graham, if nobody else wants to pipe. It's hard with Zoom to pipe up. <laughs> it's two uh, centimeters. Okay. Yeah, two centimeters. Yeah. So the, the presumption I would make on reading is, is that the uh, nodule is now two centimeters approximately in diameter. Okay. Uh, has it gotten bigger? It's been less. Has it gotten bigger since the last exam? Yes. And where, where is the tumor? Uh, left upper lobe. Okay. So let's look at this. The first sentence says there's a nodule in the left upper lobe. And, and I said, I asked you how big the nodule is and, and the sentence talking about the nodule doesn't even say anything about the size. So why did you say it's two centimeters when it says nothing about the size of the nodule? Well, the uh, reference to the diameter of approximately two centimeters uh, implies to me that the well circumscribed nodule described in the left upper lobe is the context by which that sentence diameter of approximately two centimeters applies. Okay, so, so you assumed that the word nodule and the word tumor are referring yeah. to the same entity in the body. Yeah. All right, so that is something that a human can do, but even humans, you know, get mixed up on this sometimes. I mean, to, are tumor and nodule typically synonyms for each other? Uh, if once again, you'd probably be looking at a series of Venn diagrams that one would be a, a subset of the other. <clears throat> yeah. So as as a as an English speaker, you did co-reference resolution, and so you saw tumor and you saw nodule. You assume they're talking about the same entity, and so now all the characteristics of that entity mentioned in the text are applied um, to each other. Uh, but that's something your NLP system has to be able to do. Yeah. If they were in different paragraphs, I'd be a bit more concerned. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a, that's a really hard problem. Okay, I put some things in here and, and we will post the slides and if anybody wants to read more about those types of things. So as, as you can see, developing an NLP application is a process. And you start with obtaining the notes. And um, okay, so that seems really easy. Step one, get the notes. 
but as Karen Verspoor on the, on the line uh, could, could attest and many others, that can be years in the making and, and being able to access those notes and use them often means that you have to have some type of de-identification. You have to test your de-identification and show people that it works well. And so just getting the clinical notes can be uh, a showstopper. The second step, once you have those, is, is from that super set of notes, you have to find the right documents um, that are relevant for your task. And again, that can be a hard task. We were looking at um, trying to identify patients with carotid stenosis and in the VA in the, VA in the US. And there, there aren't um, you know, reports that are titled you know, carotid stenosis report. There are various types of reports where they do imaging on the neck. And so we got a lot of neck exams, but many of them had nothing to do. They didn't even look at the carotid artery. And so we had to build an NLP system just to find the notes that were relevant for our problem. Okay, the next step is to um, look at those notes like we did and create the gold standard. You know, does the patient have dyspnea? Do they have a fever? And for that, you often recruit clinical experts, um, sometimes non-clinical um, experts can, can perform this task too, depending if they're, if they're trained for, for it. And you have to define what you're looking for like we did. You know, I, I named those five variables and you, you, you start to annotate and mark them up and get the right answers. Uh, and, and this is a very long process. And um, this is a, a, a very long process, let me just say. <laughs> okay. Uh, and when you annotate, um, there are a lot of different tools out there that you could use. Now, if you're looking at the document level like we, we were, does this document represent a fever? You could use Excel and just put ones and zeros in there. But if you're looking at the sentence and you're trying to identify you know, the mentions of it, then you, have, you need to have a special tool. And there are various tools out there for doing that. Once you have those annotations, you can now train your system. And for a rule-based system, training just means looking at those answers that the expert assigned and then building the rules and creating the lexicon and things for your system. And then once you've trained it and, and tested it on your training data, then you can uh, evaluate it and see its performance. So it's a journey and it often takes months or, or year or years, depending on what you're working on. So let's step through some of that together of actually building an NLP application. And, and rather than do a demo, I just did it all on slides because I didn't want to get stuck with the demo problem. <laughs> well, yes, uh, I, <laughs> well thought out. Yes, and so I, I, I was doing the backup slide and I thought, you yeah, know, I'm just going to do the slide. So the, the use case that we're going to use is early screening for breast cancer. And so we, we want to know, did the patient have a relative um, with breast cancer at, you know, under a certain age, under a certain age, and that would indicate that we want to recommend to that patient that they see a genetic counselor um, because they need to be screened early. And so this is a project at, in place at the University of Utah and it's implemented in EPIC. So that it goes into my chart, it flags the, pay, the, the record, it sends them an email on, on the patient portal and, um, and then they can go see a genetic counselor. All right, but it's all based on NLP. So first thing we need to do is we need to figure out how are we gonna identify mentions of breast cancer. And so I have, um, the first thing I'd put in my dictionary is the phrase breast cancer. All right. Now I'm going to start doing some annotations and looking at the text, and and I and I got I've got 60 reports annotated here of whether or not they indicate family history of breast cancer. Um, so yes means family history of breast cancer, and so um, the columns are the actual answer. It's the gold standard answer of yes, it's a history of breast cancer or no. The rows are what my NLP system um, said, and my NLP system right now is just the phrase breast cancer. So it's doing pretty good with just that simple phrase. The blue ones are false negatives. That means that I said it's not breast cancer, but it really is breast cancer. So now I need to look at those and say, how, what did I miss? Oh, I keep hitting the arrow and then it's, yeah, that's what that beep is. Okay, so I see, oh, oh here's uh, one of the ones that the expert said was a positive case for breast cancer and I missed it. And that's because I, I, I guess I need to have breast CA in there too, not just breast cancer. So I'm gonna add that to my dictionary. And oh, here it says breast carcinoma. Okay, so I'm gonna add that to my dictionary. And that should improve my performance, decrease my false negatives. Okay, but oh look, the performance stayed the same. 
Um, that's because knowing its family history, you can't just identify the word breast cancer. You need to be looking at the context as well. So let's start looking at those attributes. So here's uh, an example where we got the name NCE recognition right. We identified breast cancer, uh, but we can see that we don't have sister in the dictionary. So um, and and so we need we need to add sister, and then we would get these right. But as long as I'm adding sister, well, I'm going to add you know brother, mother, father, aunt, and you know a bunch of terms. I I don't want to have to discover them all from text. I have uh, I have knowledge. And there are knowledge bases out there where I can get all the relatives that are relevant and I can add them. So I'm going to do that. So now my dictionary is starting to get bigger. Okay, so, so now I see that the first one, by adding sister, I got it right now. We've got sister and it, it applies to the word, to the term breast cancer. And so we're going to call that positive for family history of breast cancer. Uh, when I look at the second one, we again, we've got sister and we've got breast cancer. And so we get another true positive. But now I, you know, I added brother and that created a false positive. It's saying the brother has breast cancer, which is possible, right? It's not that we shouldn't, it's not that we should leave brother out of our dictionary, but what's, what's going on here? How would a human know that the brother doesn't have breast cancer from this sentence? Graham? If you're still on. Yeah, sorry. I was just trying to get in my mouth to find <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, we, we see that the brother is healthy, so we make the assumption that he doesn't have breast cancer. Um, so that, that linkage key, um, for, term with the IS is really key to that distinction. Okay, yeah, so, so I, I need a smarter NLP system. It can't just take all the, all the modifiers like brother and sister and just you know, apply them all to breast cancer. Now, I, the NLP system algorithm I'm gonna use can address this, it would look for the word while, and it would say, when I hit the word, I've, I've got brother, and then I see the word while, I know I'm moving on to something different. So I'm gonna stop um, applying that modifier and, and move on to the rest of the sentence. So that's what I need to do. I need to change my algorithm, not just the dictionary. Okay, so here's another false negative. We've got, uh, has a daughter living at 54 with breast cancer. So, okay, I need to add daughter. I hadn't thought about daughter because, you know, so I'm gonna add daughter to the dictionary and that fixes that case. But look, here's another case that pops up. It says H, which I'm assuming means history, uh, unclear. Daughter is a poor historian, has history of breast cancer and possible pulmonary fibrosis. Okay, so I my algorithm said that the daughter is, has scope over breast cancer. And so daughter is a modifier for breast cancer. But in, in reality, it's probably saying the patient has history of breast cancer, but the daughter is a poor historian. And so, so now I created a new false positive. All right, so what I want you to understand from this is you're gonna start building these things and you're gonna fix things, but you're gonna break things as you fix things. And that's part of the process. So you might say, oh, well that, that's because you're doing a rule-based system. Just forget about this. Let's just use machine learning, and then we don't have to deal with that. Um, so return to this. You can use machine learning or deep learning for natural language processing. And so in machine learning, you've got a training set. And what you do is you say, oh, I see a sentence, you know, and I'm going to annotate that and call it negative. And then um, there's some other sentences that I label as positive. And then you run an algorithm. That algorithm tries to create some kind of mathematical function to separate out those that you called negative from those that you called positive. And then when you give it a new case, it applies that, that same mathematical function and assigns the most likely classification. So that's how it works in general. Brian, what the time is it? Okay, so there, there are pros and cons to rule-based versus machine learning. And you'll, you, you will need to probably try out both of them. Rule-based is it can be very quick to develop um, and machine learning, you might need a lot more training data than you have. But with a rule-based system, you could build in just an hour, you could build an NLP system to, with a, with a rule-based system. Now, it might not be perfect, but you could get going on it. Um, but rule-based things are hard to scale. The more rules you add, the more they interact and, and you can have thousands and thousands of rules. Um, rule-based systems are more interpretable though, because if you say, you know, this patient has, has a fever, um, you can point to the text of where you found it 
and machine learning is often a black box. It just gives you the answer. But there is a lot of work in the space now to help make it more interpretable. interpretable. Well, what about deep learning? Everyone's probably heard about that. Is it a miracle? Well, that's for another talk, and I'm not the one to give that talk. <laughs> All right, so I, I described natural language processing like this beautiful Ferrari. And maybe now you're thinking, oh, it's really just this clunker in the junkyard. This is just terrible, and it looks awful. And can it even do anything? But in reality, it's more like a Subaru, I say. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it can be useful. It's a lot of work, but it can be useful. So returning to the story I started with, with Sasha, um, you know, she hired those people. And then we, we built an NLP system using the data that they had already done. You know, we did this after the fact. But we were able to make it so that if they had started from scratch, they only would have had to review 10% of the reports that they, that they reviewed. So 10% of two years rather than the full two years. And so it really could have been helpful. And, and we have shown this in, in many other studies since then. This is uh, an instance of um, the VA national surveillance system that's going on right now in the US. And so shout out to um, Makoto, Kelly, and Alec who are working on this. And um, when, when a patient gets tested for coronavirus, they, it's uh, done in the lab. And if they're tested in the VA system, then they know whether it's positive or not. But a lot of the veterans are not tested in the VA system. And so now if, if the VA wants to be able to plot all the cases, um, they're missing the patients that weren't tested there. So they are using natural language processing on the text and in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see that. But they have a human review. So this is the screen the human reviews. If, a if the NLP system says the patient is positive for COVID-19, then um, the, the human looks at this case and is able to look at the information from the lab tests and other EHR information with the information from the text and confirm it or not. And if it's confirmed, then it goes into the counts. So this is in real um, use right now. This is a system at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital where they're using natural, this is from Noemi El Haddad, it's a system called Harvest. And so it, it runs over the entire patient record and it puts all of the problems that are mentioned in the record in the middle as a word cloud and those that are bigger are mentioned more often. If you're looking for dyspnea, so you click on dyspnea, it turns purple, and now it has a timeline. And every time dyspnea is mentioned across the, the, that patient's timeline, it's meant, it's, it shows up on the timeline and you can click on it. And when you click on something, it shows you know, all the notes that dyspnea is mentioned on in the, in the bottom left. And when you click on a note, it shows that note on the right and, and where it mentioned it. So this is a way to like really pull information from across the record um, for, to, to help um, find things that, you know, more quickly. And they evaluated and showed that it was, it was really helpful for the clinicians. And it was in use as of um, a year or two ago, but I'm not positive that it's still in use. This is a system at, again, at the VA in the US. And um, Andrew Garon has been working on quality of colonoscopy exams using natural language processing. And so built an NLP system and it's being applied ac across the whole United States. And it tells the adenoma detection rate for every clinician and gener generates this report card. And so you as Dr. Smith can see how you do compared to your peers and try to improve that. So it really can be um, do some great things. And you need to ask yourself, is it feasible for your goal? And so I'll give, just end with a few quick heuristics. So first, can you access the data? That's the first question you need to ask yourself. OK, once you have the data, is the information you want actually in the text? Because sometimes it's just not there, or it's not described well. And then you got to think about how complex is your problem. Um, is, is, are, are the things you're looking for explicitly mentioned, or do you have to have inference? So brother at bedside, if I'm looking at social support, I have to recognize that when it says the brothers at the bedside, that patient has social support. And that's much harder than recognizing that chest pain means chest pain. Um, vocabulary size and ambiguity. You know, the word pneumonia, it, it, it always means pneumonia. But when you see the word fall, at least in the US, it can mean the patient fell or it can mean the season. And that can cause a lot of trouble for your algorithm. How rare is what you're looking for? Because if it's only mentioned in every, you know, 200 patients um, or, or, or worse, like when you're looking for homelessness, that's really rare and hard to find. It's important, but it makes it a lot harder to build and evaluate. And then if you're launching a system, your positive predictive value is going to be really low when something's rare. And finally, 
do you care about time? Because if it's, if it's involving time, it's not an easy problem. Even what you may think is simple time, like when, when's the first uh, mention of diabetes or you know, when they first start experiencing pain, that's even hard. And finally, how accurate does your output need to be? And so a lot of these examples I showed, they, they, there's a human in the loop and they aren't, um, you know, it's not a black box that's making a diagnosis. So think about that. Can you put a human, human in the loop in what you're trying to do? But it can be done. These are some uh, people that I partnered with in Utah before I came here, working on a variety of different areas. Uh, some of them really got into NLP and are building their own NLP systems. These are all physicians or nurses. Others of them um, just partnered with us, but it really does take a partnership. Um, it, it's, it, it's a harder process than it seems. And, and so you need to partner with an NLP team and, and clinician and we need each other. So NLP can be powerful, it can do a lot. Uh, it is a long journey, but it's an adventure and a lot of fun. And I hope that you guys will, uh, if you're gonna go down that path, you'll give us a call and we can join you on that adventure. And with that, I'll take any questions that you have. Thanks, Wendy.